Ephesians chapter 6 contains one of the most beloved passages in Scripture, and uh, that's the armor of the Lord. The King James Version translates verses 13 through 15 as this, And having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's interesting about the verbs in these verses is that they're characterized by sigma alpha, and they have the middle passive participle morpheme, mena, uh, and they are all plural. So, having done all comes from the Greek verb, katergesaminoi. Having your loins girt about is formed from perizosaminoi. And having the breastplate on would be endusaminoi. And having your feet shod comes from hupadesaminoi. And we might ask ourselves, well, what's the significance of these participles? Well, we're going to study in this uh, lesson about how the aorist participle, when it forms with the middle voice, it's generally reflexive unless it's a little more deponent. So the idea is these are things that we are to do to ourselves. What's also interesting is uh, that these denote uh, action that's anterior to the timing of the main verb, and there's some imperatives in the context. But the significance of these being in the aorist is that it's not that he's introducing a new idea here. For instance, um, some of the main concepts here are truth, and the concept of truth appears, I have these verses in parentheses in 113 and 415, verse 21 and 25, and chapter 5, verse 9. Righteousness is a very important theme in chapter 4, and how the gospel brings peace, particularly between Jews and Gentiles, is one of the main points of chapter 2. And so it's, it's as if he's saying, now that you've already learned these things, let me try to capture all of this with a memorable illustration or a memorable analogy. Having done all of these things and having your loins girt about with truth, having heard this epistle and now having applied it, let me conclude with a memorable analogy. I think this is helpful because uh, sometimes we deal with Ephesians 6 and the armor of the Lord as if it's a new concept in the book, but really the best way to handle it would, all, would be to refer to these concepts as they've already appeared in the book, because this is just kind of a summary analogy of the things he's already taught. All of those are things that we can learn by just looking at the tense and the voice of these participles. So let's talk about these in a little more depth. In this video, we're going to consider the aorist or the undefined participle. Probably better to think of it as the undefined participle because they don't in and of themselves carry past time, although we will see that often it does indicate time that's interior to the main verb. Anyway, undefined is a good way to think of this participle. Because participles indicate aspect more than time, we're just going to call it the indefinite. The indefinite often forms from a verbal root and is therefore easy to distinguish from a noun. We've already talked about how these participles take case endings, but as these uh, participles, as we'll see, continue, gonna continue to form from a root, usually we can distinguish them from nouns. So here's what the aorist active participle looks like, and let's make a few notes about it. Uh, when this participle appears and it does not have the article, and this is review, it'll be translated more like a verb, more adverbial, and there will often be a keyword after or having that we'll want to provide with the translation. We'll talk about that in more detail in a second. If it does have an article, then it's going to be translated more like an adjective. In this video, we're going to deal with the translation for both, when they're adverbial or when they're adjectival. The sigma alpha, okay, we already recognize that. That's the aorist tense formative, and it indicates indefinite action. This action of this participle will normally have happened previous to the main verb, and that's something that the keywords are going to help us understand. So when we do translate them, and when they're adverbial, generally the keyword after, with whatever the verb is, plus ing, or having, plus the past participle, which is when the verb ends in ed, works fine for translation. So for instance, um, after loosing or having loosed would be fine for all of these forms. In participles, something we want to note is they'll often be translated like indicative verbs. Uh, for instance, the, the phrase that we see all the time in the Gospels is, He answered and said. Well, what's interesting, if we translated it literally, it'd be answering, he said. But that sounds kind of awkward in English, so usually translators opt for an indicative translation rather than um, uh, 
uh, participial translation. So that'll be something we want to keep in mind. It's okay to do that when otherwise it would make for really awkward English. So all of these could be translated after loosing or having loosed. Let's talk a little bit more about the formation of these and uh, memorization and translation. So first for the formation, notice that it doesn't have an augment and that's because even though it's technically aorist or undefined better, uh, it doesn't indicate time as much as it does the kind of time which is the aspect so it doesn't have the augment. If we look at the first form lusos there in the masculine uh, nominative singular slot, uh, it technically forms from lu plus sigma alpha plus nu tau plus sigma. What happens is the tau meets the sigma and it simplifies. The nu drops out. It ends up being just lusos. Or if we look over in the right hand column, in the neuter column, lusan. Tau cannot stand at the end of a word so it drops out. The final form is just lusan. If we look down in the date of plural, again the square of stops occurred and when tau meets sigma it simplifies to sigma and nu does not like to go before a sigma and that drops out and the final form would just be lusasin. And then in the feminine column if we look at the genitive and dative singular we see that the alpha, in other words lusasa is the nominative singular, genitive singular is lusaseis, dative singular lusasei. That alpha shifted to an eta. That happens with a lot of nouns in the nominative singular. Their stem vowel ends in an alpha. They'll shift in the genitive and dative singular. So that shouldn't throw us, out, throw us off. That happens with a lot of other nouns too. For memorization, uh, we can just remember the nominative and genitive singular forms. Uh, technically, it's not necessary for the feminine because that's first declension. It follows normal rules but we'll do it for the sake of consistency. If you find a better way to do it, feel free. The biggest thing is, since these follow third declension uh, case endings, we want, want to remember the genitive because that way we can see the whole stem. In other words, the vast majority of the masculine and neuter, you can see that their stem ends in new tau. So it's the new tau and then comes the third declension case endings. We don't want to forget what the stem looks like in most of the forms. As far as the translation goes, we said in an earlier video that the participle is connected to verbs and nouns and it increases the fullness of expression similar to the way a bridge uh, increases the transit or the amount of traffic between uh, two sides of land. When functioning more like a verb, it will not have the article. And it will be accompanying another indicative verb in the context when it's translated more like a verb. When this happens, generally the keyword having plus the past participle or after plus the verb plus the suffix ing works fine for translation. So let's take a look at how this works. If we saw lusantos esosen appear in context, notice that the participle doesn't have an article. After loosing would be a fine translation. After loosing he saved. That would be fine. Let's take a look at some of these, how they actually appear in scripture. Agapesas. Okay, that's from agapao and it's got the sigma alpha and it's a uh, nominative singular masculine and this would just be translated after having or I'm sorry having loved his own who were in the world having loved his own who were in the world here's another one kai lale santas en perge ton logon katebasan um, and having spoken the word in Perga they descended now there's another possibility we could possibly put and after speaking the word in Perga, they descended. And really, there's no difference between the two. Um, so it's really up to the translator as to how he wants to do it. There's maybe a slight nuance between the two, but either way, we understand from these translations that the process of speaking happened anterior to the, to, uh, the fact when they descended. That's something that the keywords help us understand. And that is the, the significance of this aorist participle. Usually it indicates anterior time. Uh, but there's another thing. If we look at this Greek sentence, akousos de tauta, ha Jesus e thalmas en alton. Okay, if we try to translate it, and having heard or after hearing these things, Jesus marveled at him, that would work fine. But what's interesting about this verse is it seems to be indicating that the process of Jesus marveling at him. It, well, when did that happen? After he completely finished speaking? Or did it happen somewhat during the time he was speaking? And it's kind of hard to determine. Something that we will sometimes need to do with the aorist 
participle is make it happening at the same time. And that's something that upon does. We could say, and upon hearing these things, Jesus marveled at him. There will be a number of aorist participles uh, that should probably be translated as contemporaneous time, like upon hearing, as we've done here. Just something to keep in mind. So let's take a look at the formation of how these second aorist or irregular indefinites are going to form. Remember, there are some verbs that form directly from the root, and they don't look exactly like the present tense stem or the lexical form. So uh, lambano, right? The root is lab, and that would be formed from the root. Then it would have the connecting vowel. Then would come the participle morpheme, and then finally the case ending. So here's one that appears in the scriptures. And they took him and cast him out of the vineyard. Now, I decided to translate this as just a regular indicative verb, which I've already mentioned sometimes we need to do. And that's because if we try to plug in our key words, they don't quite work. Again, after taking him, having taken him, sounds a little funny, so we'll just translate it as an indicative. When it's translated more as a verb, or when it appears adverbially, um, it can also be independent. Sometimes it will stand alone. Uh, Lusantas, if it just appeared that way, it might be translated, he saved. Paruthentes is an aorist passive participle, but it has more of an active translation because it's deponent. And what's interesting is it carries the force of an imperative. There's a few imperatives in scripture that appear as participles. And this would be best translated, not like, therefore, uh, after going, make disciples of all nations. No, it's more contemporaneous time, but it really shares the force of the verbal action of the imperative. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. So, sometimes they're going to appear also as adjectives. And when they do, they can function as an attributive or as a substantive. When they appear this way, they prefer the article. Normally they'll have it, but sometimes they appear without the article and they're still functioning adjectivally. Something to keep in mind. They will also be modifying a noun in the context with which they agree in case, number, and gender. And the translation normally ought to reflect past time. So, uh, we could if we saw this, of the man who loosed. And we can see that we'll often want to keep the key word um, if it appears in a particular case. Not always, but often. So here's a verse. According to the power of God. And now the participles are modifying God. The next one comes to sosantos. And then the last one is kalesantos. Notice that they're modifying the noun theu. Theu is genitive singular, right? Theu. It ends in the upsilon there. And then we've got sosantos, kalesantos, both of them end in omicron sigma. The third declension, they are also genitive singular. And so these are pointing back to God, they're modifying. And so we would translate them, having uh, needing to provide who, the understood relative pronoun God, who saved us and who called us. This would be an example of the participle functioning attributively. There's another noun in the context and it shares the case number and gender. When it functions like a substantive, it will appear, appear all by itself. And often you are gonna, gonna need to keep the key word. Here, for instance, that we could translate this of the one who loosed. We'll also sometimes need to provide the understood noun or pronoun. Here's an example. This appears in the nominative case, so there's no key word to keep. But this would be translated, blessed are the ones who, because we've got the article there. And it's actually going with two participles. Yidantes is a participle, and so is pistusantes. And I highlighted pistusantes because it has the features that we're talking about right now. Blessed are the ones who have not seen, and yet pistusantes believe. Hoi pistusantes. What does that mean? Well, it's a substantive. It's standing all by itself. The ones who believe. If we put believed and made it past tense, which is often what we need to do with these aorists, it sounds a little funny in this context, and so we've decided to uh, put it in the present tense there. Let's take a look at the middle voice. The middle voice, just like we saw for the present or continuous participles, are going to have the participle morpheme of mena and mene, and they follow second and first declension patterns. 
Sometimes these are going to be active. For instance, if it's a deponent verb, it'll have the middle uh, morpheme, but it will actually have an active translation. But other times, and oftentimes, they're going to be reflexive. And sometimes there will be another noun or pronoun in the context, like al tu, which makes it clear it's reflexive. That means himself or herself. Uh, but often they will be. We're going to see that the passive voice in the aorist has a completely separate formation. So we don't really have to guess if it's passive or middle. These are just middle. Let's look at an example of how they'd be translated then. Lusominus esomen, esosen. If we want to include the keyword having, we could translate it having loosed himself, he saved. Or if it was one of the second aorists, we'll use labominos, having taken himself, he saved. Or if we wanted to use upon. Lusominos esosen. Upon loosing himself, he saved. Labominos esosen. Upon taking himself, he saved. Now we could include after as well. For instance, after loosing himself, he saved. That would be a possibility too. If uh, the verb or if the participle was functioning as an independent, if we saw lusominos, again, the point of all of this is to show us that it's often reflexive, he loosed himself. Or labominos, he took himself. Attributive. It would appear with a noun or pronoun in the context with which it would agree, case number and gender, of the man who loosed himself, or of the man who took himself. And as a substantive, it would be appearing all by itself, often with the article, to lusominu, of the one who loosed. And notice how we kept the key word, because it's in the genitive. To labominu, of the one who took. These are some examples of how we would translate the middle voice, and we'll have plenty of opportunities to practice these in the homework. And the passive voice. The passive morpheme is theta epsilon in the aorist passive. It looks a lot like the theta eta, which if you can remember back a few lessons, is the tense formative for the aorist passive indicative. So they're similar. It's theta epsilon and Notice that it takes the active morpheme nu tau in the masculine and neuter. Isn't that kind of funny? Let's take a look at the passive voice. If you look at the participle morpheme, it's theta epsilon. And that looks a lot like the theta eta, which, if you can remember back a few lessons, is the tense formative for the aorist passive indicative. So it looks a lot like it. Forgive me, I made a mistake on this slide. The masculine and neuter are actually third declension because their stem ends with the new tau, as we've seen for uh, other participles. But that's interesting, because this is a passive participle, yet it takes the active morpheme new tau. New tau is the active morpheme. But as we've seen for the aorist and the passive voice in the indicative, it actually takes the active endings. I don't know if you'll remember that, but that's kind of something real strange about the aorist passive. Well, the aorist passive participle does the same thing, in the sense that it takes an active participle morpheme, which is nu tau. The feminine doesn't. Uh, the feminine has a morpheme that is thesa, or these, in the genitive and dative singular. Then it follows a first declension pattern. So we have then the stem, which in this case would be lu. Then we've got the theta epsilon. And if it's masculine or neuter, the nu tau. If it's feminine, it's going to have the yoda sigma afterwards. And then we've got the case endings. Whenever we translate these, we'll want to include the fo a form of B. So let's take a look at how this might work. Um, for instance, after being somethinged, luthes esosin, we could put after being loosed, he saved. Or if we wanted to, uh, the context demanded something that was more contemporaneous timing upon being, it would be upon being loosed, he saved. Notice how we're just including the keyword being. Uh, in this case, the substantive will often want to include the past tense form was. Luthes, he who was loosed, would be an option. If it was attributive, of the man who was loosed, because again, look at the participle form, it's got the theta epsilon, that should tell us, okay, it's passive. He was loosed. Or if it was substantive, to luthentos, of the one who was loosed. Uh, if it's substantive, we have to look at the wider context to figure out just exactly who's the subject of this action. Well, I hope uh, this video is helpful to you as we seek to better understand and translate these aorist participles.